All right, I think that we are now live. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to start off the show today. We're really excited to have uh, Dr. Ann Childers. And uh, she is a psychiatrist and a very unusual psychiatrist, uh, one that, uh, that I think has a great philosophy because she is passionate about nutrition and sleep, two of my favorite uh, topics and two of the, uh, the biggest, uh, biggest uh, small hinges that oh, swing big doors as a as one analogy that I think I heard um, from uh, Dr. Sarah Gottfried a while back. And uh, so welcome to the show, uh, Dr. Ann. And uh, so just le let's get one big question out of the way. How, why is it that uh, so few psychiatrists pay attention to the value of sleep and nutrition? I, I think we're starting to make some headway in this area, but it's not nearly enough. Back in the 1980s, when I went to medical school, by the way, I was about 10 years older than most of the people in my class, um, I had already had a brush with nutrition. First off, I had taken a nutrition class at a community college level, and then I started training dogs. Now, that was a big eye-opener. I bet. It turned Yes, it was. You could definitely tell which dogs were on poor diets and which dogs were on good ones. And the dogs that were on good diets had bright, clear eyes. They had beautiful coats, no dandruff, no oiliness. Uh, the nose was moist. The pads were moist. And they were calmer than the other dogs. And wow. I thought, I wonder why we don't look at people that way. Why don't we look for a shiny coat and clear eyes and uh, moisture in the skin, things that are signs of health. And then later on, I was accepted in medical school when I was about 33 years old and uh, started in 1988. And during that time, I noticed that our the amount of nutrition that we were actually exposed to is very little. Yes. In fact, I think we were one of, uh, Oregon Health and Science University was one of only, I think, maybe 26 schools at the time that had any nutrition class whatsoever. Wow, that's, uh, that's crazy. Yes. And so uh, if you think of nutrition as being uh, something that, co that contributes to, I call it, chemicals and carpentry, that is, it's not just helping us with the chemicals and hormones that we need, but it's also a building material that builds our bodies, then I think giving it short shrift is not a good idea. No, not at all. Not at all. And, you know, I, I, we were speaking a little just before we started about a study you had uh, um, had mentioned uh, that was dealing with uh, prison inmates and uh, and nutrition. Would you? I think that would be interesting to the to folks that are listening. Could you share that with us? Yes, it was it was performed in the United Kingdom, and these were young prisoners. They were probably somewhere, as I recall, somewhere between nineteen and twenty one, and these young prisoners. Uh, were surveyed for their incoming diet. In other words, what were they eating prior to incarceration? Yes. And it turned out that a lot of these kids were eating the equivalent of like chips and soda. Right. And there's virtually no protein in that. And uh, there are a lot of missing nutritional elements, to say the least. Oh, sure. So what they did is they had two groups. One group was the control group. There was no intervention there, uh, but except for perhaps a sham intervention. And then the other group uh, received vitamins, minerals, and fatty acids. And lo and behold, uh, the reduction in aggression, in antisocial behavior, and uh, other undesirable behaviors such as disruptive behaviors declined by as much as 30%. Wow. That's so the, the United Kingdom, the government, uh, started asking the question, uh, why are we putting people in prison when what we should be doing is reforming the way we feed people? Well, that would make a lot more sense uh, to deal with, the, deal with some of the causes of the problems. And uh, that's, uh, that's a great point, great, a great thing that, that could, be, uh, could really impact public health and, you know, in, all over the place. In a, mm -hmm. in a big way and, uh, and uh, you know, re reduce crime. At this, I mean, it should be, it sounds like it would be easy for a politician to get behind that and sell that 
you know, mm -hmm. because you want to sell, you know, everyone is, a, everyone who's not afraid of, you know, crime at some point in their life. And, uh, and right. uh, even if, you know, wherever you live, you, you know, people who would be against that, you know, if we could, it would be, but I think, I've, I think I've not, I don't think it's something that's talked about. And maybe, I don't think maybe a lot of people are aware of that correlation. Um, now, let me just, let me change gears slightly, but on the same, uh, moving sideways with the topic of nutrition and behavior, um, what about, uh, have, would you, what are your thoughts on as far as the typical children's problems, you know, with uh, ADD and things like that? Have you, have you dealt with that and, uh, and do you see some, uh, what can you tell us about your experience there? Well, I can tell you that the people that come into my office are, are self-selected groups. So sure. these are people who have either a diagnosis of ADHD or some type of uh, behavior problem with ADHD. But almost uniformly, what I see is a decline in ferritin levels. And ferritin is basically the most sensitive indicator of iron. for iron scores. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and most uh, pediatricians don't use ferritin. Uh, I use uh, both ferritin in adults and children. I use both ferritin and C-reactive protein because ferritin is artificially raised when there's a lot of inflammation in the body and the C-reactive protein will tell us whether that inflammation may be present. So I do both uh, measurements simultaneously and I almost uniformly see levels that are below 50 nanograms per milliliter. Now, the reason that this 50 is important, and those of you who may be listening to this, you'll probably want to write this down and ask your doctor. Uh, the reason the 50 nanograms per milliliter is important be is because below that, there is a uh, there, is, there are studies showing that there's sleep disturbance, restless leg syndrome, and when you take a look at ADHD and you look at restless leg syndrome, they look an awful lot alike. So, what, I'm sorry? I said very interesting. I've not, not heard that connection. Uh -huh. Yeah, and so when you think about iron metabolism and whether this child is faring well, uh, these children are often growing at rapid rates and they often outgrow their iron stores. And some are even born with low iron stores, especially children who are of mothers who are either vegetarian or vegan. Oh, I bet, yeah. Yeah, but but it's a universal problem, and it's becoming more and more of a problem among women of reproductive age. So I make sure that I get that ferritin level, and if it's below 50, I treat. And in many, many cases, I see a decrease in ADHD symptoms. Wow, that's uh, very interesting. What about uh, some other, uh, other markers? For example, which, do you look at uh, vitamin D levels uh, as well? And Absolutely. That's typical of one of my panels. I will do, it's called a 25-OH vitamin D. And I want to make a remark on these two uh, variables so that we can kind of put it in the context of the American diet. Sure. Uh, not long ago, well actually decades ago, uh, there was a lot of discouragement for eating red meat and yet heme iron is the most absorbable iron in the diet. Right. Yes. So, so how would um, so when you have a um, you know when you have a, a vegan um, woman who is having fertility problems, uh, and have you ever had someone come to you and say, you know, uh, and and I went through a vegan period myself for as an experiment. I I lasted si almost six months, and I realized I just felt you know I felt really good for about two to three months. This was many over a decade ago. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I just wanted to say, I see if I could do it and, and uh, be able to, uh, I guess I had a, I, there was, this was before the term biohacker was, was, a, was out there, but uh, I guess I was a, I've been a biohacker at heart. And, uh, and the funny thing is after about, I guess about three months, I started feeling a little bit up and down. And then the fourth and fifth month, I was just really struggling. And, um, and then finally I realized, you know, this is just uh, not working. I mean, I'm sleeping well, I'm exercising, and I didn't, and uh, nothing else has changed because I was very careful to not change any other variables in my life and realized, you know, this is uh, obviously the only thing that's changing is my nutrition. And, uh, and now I didn't do, you know, I did not do blood tests at that time, but, uh, but I can just imagine, uh, how would, have, have you had it, I'm sure you've had some, some um, 
I don't know if you deal well. You're not not exact. You probably don't have people come to you for tip, for fertility issues directly, but uh, but you may have seen. Uh, have you seen something like that with with vegans and things like that? Well, it was it's really interesting. Um, the Native Americans knew that bear fat could help with fertility. In fact, they tried to recommend it, but the settlers at the time didn't seem too enamored with the idea. Uh, since that time, there have actually been some studies where women who eat more ice cream seem to be more fertile. Really? So I wonder whether uh, fats have something to do with that. That's certainly the old lore. Um, but also, I think the whole body has to be ready to reproduce, whether you're a man or a woman. It doesn't matter. You really need to get your body primed because uh, the quality of sperm and ova is extremely important. Uh, for women, this means uh, eating a full-fat diet, and it also means eating a good variety and getting plenty of uh, vitamins and minerals in that diet. One of the things I noticed in vegetarian vegan women is that sometimes they would show on the lab what looked like a normal B12, but actually when you look at the homocysteine, the homocysteine was high and when other factors were ruled out, it turned out that the B12 that the lab picked up was actually a B12 analog. It wasn't an active form of B12. Oh, and this, yes, and for psychiatrists this is very important because sometimes people with B12 deficiency, uh, levels measured by a lab of less than 400 typically, about 10% of those people are going to have neuropsychiatric problems related to the B12 deficiency. Wow, so B12 deficiency can cause neuropsychiatric issues. Yes, oh, and when you cool. give them their B12 back, they look good. I had a woman in who was around, I think she was in her 60s, early 60s perhaps, and she'd been at her job for 26 years and had suddenly become mute and was wow. no longer performing. And I took, I did a SLUMS, S-L-U-M-S, you can find it online, it's the uh, VA hospitals. Uh, testing for dementia and she was in the marginal range. So I checked her B12 and I believe her B12 was in the 200s. So I went ahead and raised the B12 and within a couple of months she was actually interacting with people and doing her job. So I think she had what I would call a not a pseudo dementia but a dementia that was related to a vitamin deficiency. Wow. And this is, these are areas where I think uh, psychiatrists really need to be informed. Uh, first off, they'd get better job satisfaction because they'd actually start seeing improvements. Right. Uh, yes. But also they serve their patients better. Yes, I, I, can, I can only imagine. I can, um, that, is, that is fascinating stuff. And um, I think, it'd be, I think that's, there's so much, uh, there's, you know, it, well, I'm thinking of another another type of person right now that may be listening to this who, who might be someone who's a student who's thinking about you know going into healthcare or medicine or something, and if someone mm -hmm. wanted to it, to uh, to explore that area to go into psychiatry and nutrition, is there is there a, a place that uh, any school any programs that are are specializing in that yet, or are we still uh, not quite there? I think we're not quite there yet, but I think that you will find uh, psychiatrists online who are sincerely interested in figuring this out. Um, I have what I call my bag of tricks, mm -hmm. and they're fairly mm -hmm. limited. I Obviously, I don't know everything there is to know, uh, and neither, neither does any doctor. Sure, no one does. Thing, I, yes, I would just hope that people would be open to some alternative ways of, of dealing with with disease because we all have pieces of the elephant we just need to come to the table and put that creature together yeah that great analogy great analogy well to, speaking of pieces um, what about the, the uh, one of the other fundamental uh, well before we go into sleep um, any other fundamental nutritional um, you know strategies or um, or pieces that you would would uh, you know, could talk about or would like to share with us as far as uh, maybe a, you know, a typical case that you deal with. Uh, and I found that fascinating it's, that the B12, you know, you could you could resolve a, a, 
you know, an early dementia possibly by simply getting the B12 levels up and you could possibly, right. you know, resolve the AD, ADHD with, uh, with the ferritin levels. And uh, is there any other, anything else like that you could share with us? I'd, I'd like to make another comment and tie it into ADD and also mood disorders. Sure. Uh -huh. First off, um, there's some pretty good data on fish oil, omega-3 fatty acids, and you may already know this, but, but I don't know how many people in your audience do, and that is that animals that are nourished on pasture tend to have a better balance of omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acids, and these are extremely good for the brain, whereas animals in corn lots are going to have too high of omega-6 and the risk here is uh, inflammation, systemic inflammation, uh, which is also very hard on the brain. But I also want to bring us back to fats. Fats are extremely important for mental health. Mm -hmm. You think about it, the, the brain is 65-70% fat, much of that is cholesterol and your brain does rely on cholesterol levels in sure. order to function op optimally and to build itself. We know that people with cholesterols less than 160 and children with cholesterols less than 140 have more mental health challenges, uh, including more aggressive behaviors and uh, more accidents and more school suspension. So uh, to lower cholesterol is never a good idea. But what but what I'm trying to say right now is make sure you get the best cholesterol possible. No powdered eggs. Get those eggs right off the pasture if you can. Uh, no uh, corn lot beef if you can avoid it. Or if you can't avoid it, cut off the fat and load it up with pasture-fed butter. Uh, like Kerrygold is, is one of the examples. That's, that's what we've got in our fridge at home. <laughs> exactly. Great. But these fats will do more. They'll do more for the mood. And this is where I want to talk about mood. Sure. If, if you have a kid that's disrupted during the day, he's probably up and down, up and down. And this may be in accordance with meals. The kid that had a bowl of, of unsweetened cornflakes, no added sugar, and skim milk is probably going to crash in just an hour or two. Sure. Uh, He's going to have trouble. He's going to have trouble concentrating. He's going to have, be fidgety because to your body, a bowl of unsweetened cornflakes or a bagel or a loaf of bread, all of that is sugar. It turns into sugar yes. in the stream. It gets digested rapidly. So the kid ends up having a high blood sugar level. Insulin sweeps in to save him from the high sugars. Boom. <laughs> Down he goes. Now he's hungry and maybe irritable, and I call that, a lot of people call it hangry. He's hungry and he's angry. All right, yes. <laughs> right? And he's fidgeting. And so then he gets a cookie or a bagel with some un non-fat cream cheese, and that satisfies him. He goes up. And then insulin comes in, takes the excess blood sugar, and down he goes again. He crashes. So what I do is I say I change the first meal of the day. I tell parents it's bacon and eggs all the way. No orange juice, no carbohydrates of any kind. Just that one meal, and then go on to the school lunch oh, or whatever they're going to do this the day. Yes, much better start. And so uh, pretty soon I'm getting calls from the school. Can you give Johnny a second dose of that medication you're giving him in the morning? <laughs> wow. Right? Wow. And, I'm, and I say, what, bacon and eggs? Right. And they don't understand it first. And then I explain the physiology, and it becomes clear. Right, right. Well, you know, I remember many years ago, um, the and it's and, and I'm still um, I'm actually uh, am, am returning to the um, actively to the whole world of wellness and health and just in the last year uh, I've been doing this on the side uh, but I used to be full-time in this in the early 90s and mid 90s and uh, um, until I actually burned out because much of what we were recommending then was the opposite of what we're talking about today 
So I became really <laughs> frustrated with uh, the fact that uh, you know I was dealing with uh, many different patient populations from <laughs> obese, obese. We had obese people. We had uh, folks that were hypertensive and was in a hospital setting for a while. And then later on, I went the other way and went to work with one of the cruise lines in Miami. And we worked oh. with a number of athletes. It was quite glamorous in a way, but we had the chocoholic buffet sometimes going. You know, uh, just before some of the exercise classes, it was pretty fun. Wow. So people would come <laughs> into the the gym on this cruise ship, basically wiping the chocolate off their mouth and ask, you know, hey, what's the best way to work off this gut? And like, you know, spot reduction doesn't really work. But uh, I'm I'm getting off on a tangent here. But uh, this is so fascinating. Um, I wanted to um, bring this back to your your point about the food and the medicine. And that was I remember a I was at the American College of Sports Medicine conference um, many years back. I think it was in Chicago or New York. And I went to so many of these things. I don't recall. Um, but uh, there was a, they had a shirt then that was uh, had this expression that said exercise is great medicine. And, uh, and so I oftentimes use that as a, as a term, but I think the, we could say the same, would you agree, we could say the same thing, food is great medicine. You know, g well, great food is great medicine. I guess yes. we, have to, we have to make sure, because unfortunately, you know, the whole, the whole, uh, the whole concept of food has just been, you know, like been invaded by, and the fact that uh, I think some surveys show more than, what, 75% conservatively of what we have in the supermarket is just processed, you know, stuff that comes in a plastic uh, bag or, or box or whatever. So, uh, but that concept, food is great medicine, would you, what do you think about that? Is that a good concept that well, we could? Hippocrates said it. He said, let food be thy medicine and medicine thy food. There we go. And actually, actually food trumps exercise. I know this sounds like blasphemy, but. No, no, I'm it, with you. Uh, <laughs> the, First thing is you've got to get your diet straightened around or you won't have energy to get up off the couch. And if you weigh 500 pounds, walking around the block could put some stress on your joints that you really cannot handle. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so food comes first. Food comes first. And then what happens is the mind begins to clear. The body starts to experience more energy. People become more positive. And then they're ready to embrace whatever exercise program is best for their own particular situation and for their bodies. Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm with you. Yes. Small, small changes are the way. Um, we oftentimes start uh, with, with our coaching. We, we start people with the smallest possible changes and using some of B.J. Skinner's ideas down at, from Stanford. And, and uh, you know, just like I'll start people with, with a multivitamin, the simplest thing possible. You know, obviously we can do more. But just to get them in that habit of, hey, just let's do one yes. thing and uh, trying to get them to adopt, just to also to, to, to start to believe that they can actually do something new and be, you know, and feel, you know, confident that they can do it. You know, it's, and so we always say, yes. are you confident you can do this? You know, let's make it really easy. And then after next week, we'll talk about something else. And it takes a while, but it, hey, it works, you know, if, if people... Um, but uh, do you ever, um, what about, um, now, in, anything else on nutrition you'd like to, to talk about? Yes. Uh, I did want to mention, I probably look a little unusual because I'm wearing an apron over my white coat. Okay, great. Yeah, tell us about that. Is that, uh, is that a kit, that is for cooking possibly? Yes, exactly. Because if you don't want a syringe, you should pick up a spatula. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> That's great. It's and your doctor should be with you in the kitchen. Your doctor should be helping you, uh, asking questions about how you eat and how what you eat makes you feel. I think this is one of the things when people start eating a whole foods diet, they actually start to realize what kinds of things make them feel bad. And that's a new experience for a lot of Americans. Oh yeah, yeah, I can, no doubt, mm -hmm. no doubt. Well, For example, that oh, starch ahead. lunch that makes people sleepy in the office. Um, so they, they start to realize, oh, when I eat uh, refined carbohydrates, I feel dozy. And when I eat other things, I feel good. Or they may even have some food sensitivities, and they realize there are some foods they can't really go back to. Right. 
Right now, where do you where do you see you know the typical problems with food sensitivities? Do you see more problems with gluten or with dairy or is it something else or a little? I think uh, the paleo diet. I use it almost as an elimination diet, and it's not a perfect elimination diet. It's got tree nuts and it's got some other things that are common allergens in the U.S. But I like it because initially it gets rid of dairy and it gets rid of wheat. And I would say the vast majority of my patients, when they try to reinitiate wheat, it doesn't go so well. So either they eat it as as an occasional. Uh, occasional addition to their diet or many of them stay away altogether right yeah i'm i'm with you i'm with you it's it, it is amazing when you first um you know when someone first actually can can feel the difference themselves you know and uh and it's not just you know someone else telling them you should do this you should eat this not that and yes. and uh and all that it's like hey you've got the power you know you can choose to eat that but here's what you're going to feel like and uh -huh. what I find is so many times is people tell me, you know, I never knew how good I could feel. Yes. You know, it's exactly. just, a lot of people, I think they're used to that sugar, you know, glucose uh -huh. roller coaster and, uh, you know, the food cravings and the, you know, just, just crazy uh, hunger, you know, uh, just nonstop because they've got leptin problems probably. And, yes. And uh, and they're just uh, really just, just surviving, you know, from day to day. And... Uh, so wow, this is great to hear uh, that you're uh, great to hear your your take on all of this. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one um, let me think if there's something else on, with nutrition. Uh, if you we mentioned the uh, fish oil, I think briefly earlier today. Um, there's some, um, you know, this is sort of splitting hairs, I think, for most people. But it's uh, do you have a do you have an idea or an opinion on if someone comes to you and they say you know is it should I go with cod liver oil or should I go with krill or uh -huh. what do you think does it make is it is there a big difference on that or do you you know for someone who's already into this um, and, and in a supplement, what I'm looking for, you could also just have oily fish several times a week. Uh, you just have to choose your fish carefully uh, because you want to avoid large concentrations of PCBs, of uh, mercury, things like this that are fairly common in fish now, unfortunately. Um, but when I am looking for a fish oil supplement, I'm looking for a supplement that where the DHA plus the EPA equals 1,000 milligrams. So that may be in some products, that may be uh, two, t two uh, fish oil caps, mm -hmm. or in the case of krill, sometimes it could be a handful. Uh, you've used half your bottle by the time you've gotten to your first dose. Wow. So if, if you just use that as your guideline, that uh, EPA plus DHA in the supplement should add up to 1,000 milligrams, then wow. I think you can find your dose. Okay. The other caveat is if people have fish burps, they're probably taking uh, rancid oils, and rancid oils should never be taken. Right. So be, make sure you get a really good brand. Okay, yeah, that's that is important. Wonderful. Well, let's uh, let's shift shift gears to another equally uh, powerful, powerfully important thing for for health and wellness, which would be sleep. Uh, tell us about what is what would you know? So many Americans, uh, and I would imagine you see this. Uh, have, how many of us have said or heard, you know, oh well, I'll sleep when I die, or. <laughs> or you know, I only slept, uh, you know, that's kind of, you know, young people say that a lot. Uh, and I, um, yeah, I hear that so often. The other thing people, the other thing that is strange is that somehow we take, it's almost like a badge. We wear it as a badge of honor that I, oh, I only slept five hours last night, but, um, but I'm in, at the office early. And, oh. uh, and as if it's, you know, I'm doing this, making this heroic effort and, uh, so how do how do you explain the importance of that of the sleep to people? What's what's been your your if you could help help us with help us help other people explain that to other people? What would you say? I would say, uh, what shape would you like your brain to be in, and then determine how much sleep you need to get your brain in that good of shape. Also, how much muscle would you like to preserve? Right. Because hormone comes at night during sleep. Yes. 
And if you don't mind having very little muscle and mostly body fat, then uh, sleep deprivation may be for you. The other thing is how safe of a driver would you like to be? How well would you like to perform at work? And how much time and energy would you like to have for your family? A lot of people who are sleep deprived go home and play video games. Oh, they yeah. need some stimulation to keep them awake. They are so sleep deprived and so energy free. They almost become stuck. In other words, they have no motivation. They have right. they're just sitting like a rock in right. front of the computer screen. And this is not a way to live. So I'll I'll sleep when I die. Well, when are you going to live? That's uh, there oh that's wonderful. That is wonderful. That's going to be, you know, that's, that is great for, um, for, that would be great for an Instagram, you know, image thing. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to think of these things. I've not, done, not even gotten an Instagram account yet, but that would be, uh, that would be wonderful. So, uh, well, you know, that's a great point. It, it's really amazing the, uh, you know, you get the, uh, um, and so many people, I, I see this a lot of times with, uh, with some people I've worked with, is they're, they're accustomed to having that bowl of ice cream, you know, at, at night after, you know, maybe at 9 o'clock or something or 10 o'clock. And then, you know, an hour later, they're in the bed. And, uh, you know, as, as you know, any, anyone who knows basic physiology, of course, the insulin levels have gone up. It's pulling, once again, just like the, kid, the story with your, your, ch the, your, uh, the kids you talked about. Uh, of course, they're going to have that insulin uh, spike. They're going to have the, the, ins the, uh, re the glucose spike. The insulin goes up, pulls it down, and then they're going to crash while they're sleeping, which, of course, wakes them up you, oftentimes. Yes. And so they're not getting, in, not getting that recuperation. They're not getting into the REM stages. It's just kind of a vicious cycle, isn't it? Yes. Well, foods, the thing I think we need to understand is that commercial processed foods act like drugs. Mm -hmm. They do. Yeah. And the more refined and processed they are, the more drug-like their actions. Uh, I held up a, a picture of sugar spikes uh, to a group of addicts and they said, wait a minute, I recognize that curve. Uh-huh because it was it was feeling good and then leading to craving bottoming yes. out and then having to have another dose and coming back up again right so yes your point is well taken the good thing about ice cream and especially homemade ice cream oh right it has some fat is, in it it has that fat and that fat can actually sustain the release of uh, sugar into the bloodstream in fact that is one of the ideas behind berries and cream oh really okay yeah that makes sense a lot of the things that our great great grandmothers did made good physiologic sense. Right. You know, I remember my grandmother. Um, my my father's actually Irish, but they immigrated, and uh, and so uh, they were used to having a farm, and they had a small farm, and had uh, six or seven cows, and uh, so you know we had uh, you know the fresh, you know, full fat, wonderful fresh milk. And oh, yes. uh, we had fig trees. She had, a, they had uh, uh, at least eight or ten fig trees. And I remember going there in summers and having, we would have mm -hmm. in the late summer, early fall, I guess, or whatever. And it would be uh, these wonderful, we'd have a bowl of figs with some, you know, some whole milk. And uh, it was just heavenly. And uh, yes. great stuff. <laughs> I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> That's why apples and cheese go together so well. Yes. If you just eat your apple as an afternoon snack, it'll drop you very soon, maybe within an hour or two. Right. But right. the cheese will help sustain you. So when you have these potentially fast-acting carbohydrates, you want to balance them with something, especially something with fat and some protein in it. Yes, that really helps sustain the energy and slow the release yes. of the, uh, the slow the release of the sugar into the bloodstream. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. so so powerful, so powerful. What a, and avoiding juices also because the juice has no opposing fiber in it. Right. So juice is going to act very much like a bagel or a bowl of cornflakes or a bowl of sugar. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. It's crazy. I um, I was uh, in a one of the big box stores uh, 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 last year um, while visiting. I was visiting some got family all over the states and uh, so um, and I remember hearing. Just people. I stood by the drink, uh, the drink, uh, the huge drink aisle for a while, and uh, and heard people say, "Well, no, let's not buy the Coke, honey. Let's buy the Fanta, 
because at least it's got some, it's a little, to, let's be healthy and buy Fanta. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I have to bite my tongue not to say anything. But, yeah. uh, you know, there's a lot of, so many fruit juices that are marketed as, as you know, quote unquote health foods. And uh, how many people don't know any better, you know, and think they're giving their kids something, something good. And, uh, uh, but, uh, so, I understand that even Coca-Cola now has a division of health and wellness. Oh, no question. Well, you know, one of the things they're doing, they're, they're, they're wonderful at marketing, you know. Um, they're actually, um, they're actually, you know, they have a huge marketing budget, lobbying budget, as you can imagine. And uh, I know here in Spain they have hired a professor. Uh, he's a guy from northern Spain. I happened saw, saw him on TV uh, recently. And uh, he's, um, he's in... Um, I don't recall his specialty, but he is a in either health promotion or, or medicine or something, and he's one of their hired guns. Wow, exactly. And so when I saw that Coca-Cola Division of Health and Wellness was supporting the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, um, I was really surprised. Right, right. Yeah, well, they're, you know, they're smart. They're trying to get ahead of this, you know, the, this whole game of, uh, the, you know, I this is what um, I know from some things I'm reading and you know you everyone maybe maybe there's other opinions but it seems from what I'm reading that they're wanting to, they're trying to promote you know that the weight loss is all about calorie balance uh, yes. which is the old you know the old thing. it's not calorie. working that all cal a calorie is a calorie and uh, it's all about uh, you know your metabolism is a cal it's just about mathematics and not about right. hormones and so yeah. if you subscribe to that theory, then you could, uh, then it gets back to what we used to believe when I was, you know, in the back in the nineties that it was, I was thinking, you know, why are my clients not losing body fat because I'm doing everything we're supposed to do. And, and I was dealing with a lot of highly motivated people and mm -hmm. uh, we're thinking, well, they must be lying to us. They must be, you know, eating, uh, eating at night and not talking, you know, not writing it in the food diary. So they must be lying. You know, they must, you know, everyone, you blame the, blame the, cu the customer. And that, that's kind of what the Coca-Cola, I think, is trying to do. They're trying to say, hey, yeah, we're, all, we're believing wellness. It's all about mm -hmm. calorie balance. So, you know, drink our Diet Coke. Well, the way that we found out how many calories is in fat, which is uh, nine calories per gram versus protein, which is four calories per gram uh, versus uh, carbohydrates, which is also four calories per gram and alcohol is considered to be seven calories per gram, is in what's called a bomb calorimeter. And the bomb calorimeter doesn't care what kind of protein you put in. You could put in shoe leather. Right. But you know, the bomb calorimeter doesn't know how a human body processes these things. I think that was one of the um, very helpful things that uh, Gary Taubes brought to the public is that a calorie is not a calorie. And the studies since that time are demonstrating it over and over again. So, so for people that haven't, you know, and there are a lot of people that have not heard, you know, this concept. Um, so if a calorie is not a calorie, then what's... Uh, what what is what is the recipe to lasting, you know, weight management? Okay, so I'm going to draw you a graph in the air. Okay, <laughs> my air graph. So if you give uh, white potatoes, uh, Captain Crunch, unsweetened corn flakes, doesn't matter what it is. If you give someone starch, especially refined starch, the blood sugar curve looks a lot like this: up, then down, and in a short amount of time. Let's say your graph is this long. All right, let me see. This long, okay? Right, okay. It, then it goes up and then down, and, and there you are, all right? So now, let's say that you take a look at how protein is going to affect you. So here's the sugar. Here's the length of our graph. Protein comes up like this. It lasts much longer. So it still does give you some glucose in your bloodstream, but it's a much more a longer and sustained and less amplitude curve. Then when you take a look at how fat affects you, then if, if uh, your uh, protein curve is up to here, fat is probably right around here. There's still a little bit of a curve, but it's not very much. And it's all about insulin. Yeah. So when, when carbohydrates hit, when that curve comes up, insulin grabs to keep you from going into a coma from too much sugar. Mm -hmm. And it takes that and it locks it away as fat.
and it keeps it locked away as long as insulin is high in the bloodstream. So there's not a way to burn your own fat when you have a high insulin level. Right. And I think that's that's where the uh, where the potholes are in the theory of calories in, calories out, because when you keep insulin low, when you keep those uh, sugar curves low, then uh, then basically uh, your body is able to release fat as fuel, and that's when you actually start burning your own fat reserves. Otherwise, you keep storing them. Yes. It turns out that the ideal way to fatten cattle, and especially pigs, they've known this since the early 1900s, is to give grains plus skim milk. And if you look at the USDA food pyramid oh, yeah. of 1990, that's have it. Exactly what it is. It was meant to support and promote agriculture. It was actually well meant. It was also meant to prevent heart attacks, but it fell long, a long way short of its objectives and actually reversed our population to an obese and overweight population to, uh, that now of people 20 and older, 49% are either diabetic or pre-diabetic. And this is according to the Centers for Disease Control. Wow, and I have not seen that one. So people with mm -hmm. Americans that are 20 and over, where 49% are either pre-diabetic or diabetic. Or diabetic, yes. So and of course, the older you get, the, the, the more greater, dense the that population job. is. Right. But we are right. now seeing type 2 diabetes in children, which we never saw before. In fact, we used to not see it below age 60. Right. Wow. That's that's you know it just all uh, it all sort of fits together. I'm seeing um, a number. I've got a a number of um, of young, you know, fairly young male um, male young business guys who are in their 30s who are having uh, or presenting symptoms of low testosterone, and yes. uh, you know once I get to know them, uh, you know some of them are either. Or will even you know a lot of them times they're embarrassed about this, but a lot of them are having problems in erectile dysfunction issues in their 30s, and uh, you know this um, and, and a lot of those uh, so you know a lot of those guys are also pre-diabetic, and mm -hmm. all of this sort of just fits in, you know, and uh, it really does. So it's you know it's it's great if you're selling if you're selling uh, the far, the pharmaceutical stuff remedies uh, <laughs> or treatments if you're treating those symptoms you know you you've got a cash cow don't you oh totally I, what I'm hoping is that now that we have these Fitbit devices and Apple's coming out with a uh, uh, watch yes. uh, we may get to the point where we can start monitoring glucose in real time and that will give people feedback as to how certain foods are affecting them rather than having to guess which is pretty much what we have to do now. It turns out that after a meal, an hour and two hours after a meal, your glucose levels are actually more telling than what we call a fasting glucose, which your doctor will probably want first thing in the morning. That may not tell the complete story for you. Right. And it's really right. important that people who are carbohydrate sensitive ratchet down particularly on those refined carbohydrates and start basically shopping the perimeter of the grocery store so they don't get into further trouble. That would be the meats, fish, eggs, poultry, vegetables, some fruits, uh, plenty of fat uh, to slow down the excursions of sugar. Um, and as I showed you with my air chart, fat yeah. is the least likely to provoke provoke insulin it's been a lifesaver for a lot of diabetics oh i can imagine I can imagine yeah, i'm pretty diabetic and i use it uh, to monitor my glucose and i have to say the numbers are great yeah well good for you i actually was um was on i'm probably would be diabetic if i was uh, i was was they i was picked i was in a uh, an ex i did i was a volunteer for a number of experiments in university i was always the guinea pig because i love going into the lab and uh uh, and just learning and stuff, and uh, so they mentioned to me at one of the experiments we were doing a, a max, a VO2 max test in an ox, in a, actually in a high humidity chamber, and I'm hooked up to you know to the oxygen, oxygen machine, and then the metabolic cart, and uh, and mm -hmm. so they were also doing you know doing blood samples, looking at lactic acid and and glucose and all kinds of stuff. Anyway, they one of the for, I don't remember the exact parameter, but one of the they they told me that, hey, it looks like you might have an issue 
with um, with you know with uh, some with glucose and with your glucose and with your insulin. And uh, ever since, then I said, well, what should I do? And I said, well, you know, you just you know, should really be careful with the carbohydrates. And uh, and I remember thinking I was reading some of the American Diabetic, Diabetic Association stuff, and they didn't really restrict carbohydrates that much. They restricted sugar. Oh. I'm thinking, well, why would the ADA, you know, say it's okay to eat a bowl of pasta? Right. Exactly. Isn't why? That crazy. <laughs> yeah, they still do that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, just cover it with insulin, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like, you know, do you want to, you know. Anyway, so, um, guys, time is flying by here. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is a great conversation. I, I feel like I could, we could go on um, um, and, and continue this forever. But uh, let's, let's ch- see if we can, if, if we can change gears um, just a little bit is there, or touch base again on, uh, on sleep. Is there anything else you could tell us about from your experience with helping people to sleep better as far as strategies or, or tools or, or, or explanations or anything? How would you, anything else you could share with us on sleep? I think adults have a little bit more control over their sleep and they kind of know how many hours they usually need. But kids do not come with owner's manuals. Yes. And and as they age, they still need quite a bit of sleep. In fact, 18-year-olds still need, on average, about eight and a half hours of sleep. And your 16-year-old probably needs anywhere from nine and a half to ten hours of sleep. And you wouldn't think of that. Right. Uh, Your 11, 12, 13-year-old, again, more sleep. So I think what we need to do is value sleep and get these kids to sleep. And I also think schools need later start times. I'm with, yes. Yes. I think think there's a Harvard study on that that came out of, in the, um, I don't know when, I don't know if it was last year or something, but you probably have seen that. So, yeah, so, so classes should start no later than, say, 8.30 for teens. Right. They just really shouldn't. And I'm seeing a lot of sleep-deprived teens with a lot of activities after school, and they're having a hard time uh, getting that going. It's yeah. just too difficult. Uh, for adults, I think what you need to do is, when you go on vacation, figure out, once your sleep is caught up, how many hours you need to feel fully rested, to really just get out of bed mm-hmm. and not feel like you're hugging your pillow and pressing the snooze button. Right. Uh, once you know that, then endeavor to get that sleep. And uh, we are we are filming right now during daylight. Is it daylight savings time? No, it's the end of daylight savings time. Correct. It's November second. But anyway, um, I I tell all the adults and children in my practice to use this as an opportunity to to go to bed at the same time, but it will look like an earlier hour because we're falling back, fall back. Yes. Yes, that's a great point. Yes, and so uh, that's one way to catch up. One thing we know about sleep cycles, though, if you've let your sleep time go too far, if your circadian rhythms aren't working optimally or are working on a different time shift, let's say you're going to bed at 2 Mm a.m. and you need to go to bed at 10, going to bed at 10 is probably going to give you a pretty rough night. It's going to take a long time for you to catch up. Yes, so the easiest thing to do is to uh, simply go to bed at later and later times, even going to bed maybe three hours later during the day, and then the next day three hours later, and the next day three hours later, until you get to your go-to-bed time. That's hard to do if you're not on vacation. Right. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's, mm-hmm. a, that's a great point. There's a, uh, a, a, a colleague, uh, a medical colleague of yours that you may not know down in San Diego who is, uh, who is really big on this. His name is, he's a, his name is uh, Kirk Parsley, and mm-hmm. he is a uh, physician with, uh, who works, uh, he's a Navy SEAL, and uh, oh, okay. we've, uh, did an interview with him. Wonderful, wonderful guy, and uh, this, was, this was his passion. You know, he's been, you can probably imagine, he's, he's trying to keep these Navy SEALs healthy, and yes. uh, he found that the, 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 biggest, uh, the biggest thing he could do was to get them sleeping better. Right. Because these guys, they, you know, they do five, they do it up to five to six. It's just really crazy when they're training, you know, five days with no sleep. And, uh, you know, that's obviously these guys have to be tough and all that. But, you know, they're, they're also asking these guys to, at, at, mo- at a moment's notice, get on a plane and go to wherever they might be going and, uh, you know, and, and go uh, 
you know, have, be stuck in a combat situation, high stress, you know, and, and uh, it's just crazy. So uh, he's, he's all over this. He just he did a TED Talk um, a couple of months ago on this. It's a short, really well done TED Talk. If you ever have any, any guys that, uh, you know, tough guys who want to, uh, who need to hear this from a guy, you know, sometimes our male egos get in the way when we're listening to uh, uh, for many things, I think, and uh, myself included. But uh, he's this big, big, tough, you know, military special forces guy who uh, who does a great job explaining it very well. So, right. um, and he's coming out. To, in fact, I, he's he will um, in the future. I told him, I said, Kirk, you've got to do a book. People need to hear it from you because, you know, so many of us guys, we don't want to. You know, we think, oh, you know, we're just being, we want to be the tough guy who can go on five hours sleep, you know. Yes. So, uh, well, uh, again, it's, the question is, um, how much dementia would you like to have? Yes. Later on. And uh, what would you like your quality of life to be? Because people who are sleep deprived, children who are sleep deprived, teens especially, are more likely to become depressed. Oh, Sure. So they come into my office with depression. Often they they have other things going on too. But but the sleep deprivation is a big obstacle to getting well. Uh, people with bipolar affective disorder, if they don't sleep, they could kick off what's called a mania, and that could end them up in the hospital. Something as simple as sleep could sabotage their wellness. Um, all of us feel better. We know we feel better when we get out of bed after we've had adequate sleep, not too much and not too little. So it's a big part of life, sleep is. Something I want to make a point of is that we, we do suffer from light pollution. There's light everywhere, yes. and especially blue light. And blue light signals to the eye that it's daytime. Yes. So blue lights are, are really hazardous to people, and they come out of our computers and out of our electronic devices. Uh, I have no financial interest in these people, but I do like their product. It's free. It's called F.Lux. Yes, got it, got it. And it is dot Lux. Mm -hmm. You can use that, and if you don't have that, you can always buy some type of amber glass glasses like blue blockers is one variety as seen on TV um, but there are many amber glasses on the market and if you start using them two hours before bedtime it will help get your brain a rest and help your brain to uh, to accustom itself to the fact that you're going to be asleep soon oh yeah that's uh, that is that is one of that is my kryptonite right there is uh, I tend to I have a very easy time staying up late and I know all this stuff and uh, I have to uh, you know one of, one of my strategies that I heard from some someone much smarter than me many years ago was use two alarms that is you know you have your morning alarm but you should mm -hmm. also have your pre-bed alarm so yes. I have an alarm I have a and it goes off an hour an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm experimenting with an hour, or sometimes I'll put it two hours before bedtime, and then yes. uh, and then you know shut down all my all the stuff you know and try to go somewhere quiet and just and I actually go into a dark room. This has been very helpful, and I and I use a very small little reading light with the light mm -hmm. you know with a clip on, so I'm yes. either uh -huh. with a Kindle or with a book itself, and uh, and I keep the I really make an effort so that the light is not look not hitting my eyes and. Uh, and that really makes a noticeable difference for um, for myself and for a number of people that I've worked with. So um, it's, it's a very low tech thing, but uh, right, exactly. Yeah. The incandescent <laughs> light, that that amber glow that it gives you, is much better than our um, energy saver lights, which have a lot of blue in them. But you can get around it by perhaps putting a yellow transparent piece of plastic on the page and reading through that. Ah, that's uh, interesting. That's that's one way to do it, uh, but your night lights and other lights, especially lights in the bedroom, should have cast amber or even um, uh, red. Astronomers use red a lot because it doesn't stimulate the eye. Right, right. So, so that, that they can look into the telescope without having that uh, white little white circle <laughs> right, <laughs> floating right. around in the iris. Uh, that's yeah. a great tip. Great. So just changing. So if people wanted to do, you know, this is such a simple thing. If people wanted to, you know, get to take this one habit or this one change, they could just go out tonight or this or tomorrow, whenever, and buy a and buy some uh, light bulbs. Uh, so you would you would suggest an amber or red light bulb, and 
and yes. just put those go ahead and put those in the you know in the bedroom and uh, maybe night lights also yes. um, would be yes. helpful. Yes, no purple, no green because those have blue in them, even right. though they don't blue. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Especially people who have kids and you know that are getting up at night and uh, yes, that would be uh, that would be great. Fantastic. I had a little boy who had a, a room full of blue lights. We changed that quick. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Yeah, I bet that that is good. That is powerful stuff. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Ann, this has been so uh, so fun and so informative, and uh, and uh, so the um, you know uh, time has just flown by here. We were going to do uh, do like a half an hour, but uh, this has been uh, this has been great. We may have to split this into two shows, which uh, we'll have a part one and part two, and uh, that'll get uh, actually that helps. Um, as you can probably, you know, probably know, it's hard to get anyone to sit down and look at an hour-long video or, or podcast or listen to a podcast. But uh, um, I think we'll, we'll we might. Uh, I'm going to pass this on to my tech guy who knows how to edit these things because I have no idea. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to suggest to him, hey, can we make this two shows? And uh, and then this is going to go up on YouTube um, in the next two weeks. And okay. uh, our iTunes show is going to be officially launching in January. We're going to try to get with that January boom with health and fitness, and uh, and and a and start off with three or four shows a week, uh, and uh, then see if we can. Sus I don't know if we'll sustain three or four a week, but we're getting a little. We're getting a backlog of shows right now in the kind of all set to hit January. You know, running hard. So great. Excited. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Hey, last uh, you so know, much. thinking yeah. about just just hit me. Uh, have you um, when is your book coming out? Oh, my book. People have asked me that. I know I need to do it. Do it. Do it. I promise you. You're you're you've got some great information. And and just I, you may have I know you may have heard this, but. You know, sometimes I think we're so close to our own stuff that we think, oh, well, everybody knows this. But just keep in mind, they don't, you know, and yes. uh, that's and number one. And then secondly, even if they know, even if people know it, when it comes, especially for your impact with other doctors, is going to mm -hmm. be very strong because you know how doctors are. Doctors don't, don't listen to anybody who's not a doctor. In my, right. in my humble experience, and I have a lot of doctors in my family, and, and there are exceptions, of course. But anyway, you could have a huge impact right there, and, uh, and you might consider doing a TED Talk also. I mean, you've got, you've got the information, you've got the position, and, uh, you know, it wouldn't, be, uh, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't take you much to do it very well. I mean, you've got uh -huh. plenty of material, so... I would love to do that. I'd love to do all of the above, actually. One of the things I'm really interested, I, I treat soldiers on the weekend, and I'm a vet myself. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, Air Force. And so um, one of the things I would really like to do is, is help them with weighing and measuring because they're under an awful lot of pressure. I remember those pressures. Yes. And uh, I think uh, you mentioned the Navy SEALs. Yeah, they have a lot of pressure from a lot of different areas, and it would be great to get them healthy and get them at the peak of performance. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things I'm interested in. But the other I'm interested in is a, a general book for everyone so that people could pick it up and sure. just go right to where they want. They could even use it as a reference, go right to where they need to go to know what they need to do. Right. Well, you definitely, you've got it, you've got it in you. Just, uh, just, hey, just do one, you know, one, uh, I, I had an interview with a guy um, a few weeks back who has um, over a dozen books. I asked him, hey, what's the secret? And he said, uh, one page a day. Oh, one page a day. That's so cool. Yeah, one page a day. Right. If, and in a year, you've got 300 pages if that's what you want. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, he, actually, you know, he told me, he told me he started with one sentence a day. And then he I worked see. that up to one paragraph a day, and then he worked up to one page a day. And Maybe that's said, you what know, you need to do. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, anybody can do that. It's a small start. But it's just like trying to, te you know, st do any behavioral change, you know. It's, it's mm -hmm. also about convincing yourself that this is part of you, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, so if you actually just commit to, okay, I'm going to do one sentence a day, you know, it's, mm -hmm. This is also a B.J. Fogg thing from Stanford, you know, like the best way to learn to floss your, te to floss your teeth is to floss one tooth a day. 
you know, the so one you, you want to save. Well, you, exactly. <laughs> and you set the bar really low, and then you have that. Uh, then you've got that habit, you know. Uh -huh. And then once you're started, it's easy to to keep going. But anyway, that's a whole nother discussion, and uh, and we should wrap this up because I know you're you're busy, and and I'm busy, and. Uh, and my wife is what it is now past uh, it is now dinner time here in Spain. Oh, so okay. uh, I know you've got more things to do today and you guys are earlier there. So, hey, so just thank you so much for coming on to the show. And uh, we look forward to staying in touch with you. And uh, we'll let you know when Great. when this goes up on YouTube and then later on when it goes up on iTunes. And it's also be on Stitcher Radio and a couple of other platforms that uh, that uh, we are we are learning about as we go here. Great. Thank you so much, Dan. My pleasure. My pleasure, Dr. Ann. Take care. All right. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.